What's behind the Sphinx's ear? Hidden in plain sight for many a millennia, there is clearly a blocking stone still in place. A blocking stone we would never have noticed if it weren't for a rather unusual source of information. Recently, we covered the amazing story of Kipriyanovich Boriska, the extraordinarily intelligent boy from Russia that, from a young age, has supposedly been able to remember a past life, a life as a pilot upon the once flourishing planet Mars, destroyed during a catastrophic war. What is extraordinary regarding this claim, however, is the remarkable information that Boriska has somehow been able to share from a very young age, information which has taken astronomers many years to realize. According to Boriska, life on Earth will change irrevocably when the Great Sphinx is unlocked, using a mysterious mechanism behind one of its ears. Unfortunately, he has not given any further details about what exactly the opening of the Sphinx will do, though this was enough for us to notice the anomaly resting upon this very ancient monument. Boriska has unfortunately since disappeared. However, while in the public eye, he claimed that he was a reincarnated soldier, placed here upon Earth to avert the same destructive fate as Mars, claiming that many of his kind exist upon the Earth calling them indigo children, often stating all of this while in a trance. Which is highly compelling, as he is not the only one who once prophesied very similar astonishing developments that would, one day, arise surrounding the Great Sphinx. Edgar Case, an American Christian mystic, would often answer questions on subjects such as healing, reincarnation, wars, Atlantis, and future events also while in a trance. Was Case also an indigo child? Graham Hancock is another figure who has publicly claimed that there are many mysteries still left to be unraveled surrounding the Sphinx, specifically that a time capsule is hidden within the Sphinx, a capsule that we will only discover as a species once we are intellectually capable of absorbing its message. When it was shared within the mainstream media recently, that an enormous cavity had indeed been quietly discovered within the Great Pyramid of Khufu. The largest of the Great Pyramids, the only one with tunnels constructed within its inside, and additionally, the only one which is, in fact, eight-sided. The reaction by the Egyptian antiquities authorities was very revealing of their attitude towards secrets being revealed to the public. Not only were the claims made from reliable sources, but they are also backed up by extensive research projects, and indeed, its resulting evidential data. However, this has not deterred Professor Zawi Hawass from publicly denying any such cavity's very existence, shrugging off all claims and accompanying research as, quote, lies and hearsay. With such enormous hurdles in place, prepared to stifle any such discoveries from going public, it is inevitably going to be an uphill battle to expose the truth regarding the Great Sphinx of Giza. From all over the planet, ancient legends of a bipedal ape-like creature, far larger yet apparently incredibly intelligent, have persisted into the modern day. Legends which arose worldwide, creatures now witnessed by literally millions of souls Yet regardless of the literally global distribution of reports of these said animals, they have remained elusive to modern science, in all but a few very interesting and curious cases, one of which being a most curious of discoveries made in 1951 on none other than the slopes of Mount Everest. Some argue that such a large creature, no matter the remoteness of its claimed habitat, if in existence, would have been captured and or exposed to the wider public by now. This, regardless of their possible intelligence, ability to see in infrared, allowing them to dodge trail cams, and also that there are discoveries of new animals, including large mammals made almost weekly on our planet. It would seem, although modern technology has brought us together, giving the apparent impression that our planet be smaller than it is, in reality, there are still vast stretches of terrain yet to be fully explored, 
and rarely, if ever, visited by man. Mysterious events have also occurred during the modern age, like that of the Dietlof Pass incident or the Pangbosh Yeti, which still reside within a monastery in Nepal, which all evade explanation without the existence of this creature. As mentioned, in 1951, an incredible find was stumbled upon by none other than Eric Shipton, an incredibly trustworthy source and man of great integrity. While on the Menlung Glacier, on the west side of Mount Everest, while looking for an alternative route to the summit, Shipton came across a seemingly unending set of tracks, recently left by a barefooted bipedal creature of massive proportions. So stunned was Shipman by this find, he carefully examined and photographed the best print, laying his ice axe beside it in an attempt to demonstrate its enormous size. According to National Geographic, quote, Shipton and Michael Ward were searching for an alternative Everest route when they came across the prints. Shipton was one of the most highly respected Everest explorers, so if he is bringing back a print, it is a real print. Nobody could ever question that." End quote. Thus, the question is, what could have made them? Could these be authentic, actual prints of a snow yeti or abominable snowman? A slightly different species of Sasquatch, one adapted to colder, more mountainous environments? Some, so convinced that Shipton did indeed encounter authentic prints, they have dedicated their entire lives to the pursuit of the truth surrounding the find. Believing Shipton not to have been an individual who would have any interest or inclination to fake such a discovery. Daniel Taylor, for example, author of Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery, has been searching for signs of this particular abominable snowman within the high Himalayas since he was a child. With the World Book Encyclopedia even approaching Sir Edmund Hillary to pursue the find's origins, he was quoted as saying, we shouldn't just go yeti searching, but should also study how people could live at such high altitudes." End quote. The publication was so convinced of their authenticity, as was Hillary himself, that they built a house at 19,000 feet and experimented on how humans acclimatized. With such efforts going into the find, one must wonder why the possibility of its existence, if you also take into account the Pangbosh remains, and also the Dietlof Pass incident, why the possibility of their reality is so passionately dismissed as impossible by so many. The Shipton prints are a mystery which is undoubtedly incredibly compelling. When people visit the southeastern Anatolian province of Mardin, this gem of lost antiquity quietly sits, often overlooked, and when one begins to investigate said site, they are often left with more questions than answers. For why does such an astonishing ruin go largely unnoticed? Why is it not more largely discussed within archaeological circles? Could it be due to the fact, as one with any level of knowledge regarding lost civilizations and the proof therein latches eyes upon the site, they instantly recognize its characteristics synonymous with these studies? matching other, yet rather interestingly, accidentally revealed ruins from around the world. The style of, and the decision to bore the dwellings from solid stone, reminiscent of many unexplained ruins, such as the underground city of Derinkuyu, a particularly interesting site when indeed discovered entirely by accident, one which to this day remains heavily debated, and to some, highly controversial. This site, known as Dara, is exhibiting geological processes which are now, unfortunately, beginning to erode it back into the landscape. The construction technique, however, still testament to its original builder's abilities and indeed its possible age. Yet this does not answer the question as to why this ruin goes largely untalked of, largely unstudied and overlooked. For parallel to the erosion argument exhibiting its true age, it can also be used as an advocate for its official dating within the Byzantine era. The lack of surviving ruins will often be used as a way to dismiss such claims of antiquity due to a lack of evidence. Thus, 
We wanted to dig a little deeper to see if, via visual evidence, we could confirm that there is indeed reason to suspect that the site could possibly generate controversy for those who originally dated the site. This to confirm our initial suspicions. Still, surviving tool marks present upon the stones match that of other controversially dated sites. How can a ruin apparently dating from the Bronze Age exhibit such long cut marks or finishes across the stone? Like that of the ancient pyramids, how could copper tools have accomplished such feats within Dara, Giza, and the other sites around the world? It is a question which we find highly compelling. The Nubian pyramids, a series of hundreds of pyramidal structures and ruins, making up part of the ancient cities of Kush and Meroe. The structures incorporate styles from many different, equally ancient ruins from around the world, displaying to all the reach of this once global civilization. The first recorded settlers in this part of Sudan date back as far as 300,000 years, with the civilization that is claimed to have built and indeed painted these structures are dated as far back as 4,000 years. The city of Kush is renowned for having the finest pottery in all the Nile Valley, evidence of the builders' past capabilities. Yet what we found the most interesting about the ruins is a decorative piece found within one of these ancient structures within the ancient city of Meroe, amongst over 200 sandstone pyramids, a depiction can be found within a rather peculiar mural. Like that of the ancient depictions of Gilgamesh, repeatedly showing carrying an adult male lion like a kitten, this image, in fact, shows an ancient giant carrying an elephant in each hand. And although this is clearly a remarkable detail, it is not the only features of note that are to be found within the picture. First brought to the attention of mainstream study in 1821 by the French mineralogist Frédéric Caillou, it has since been noted that the giant's features were seemingly Caucasian in appearance, with his hair a light red in color, something we have touched upon in the past with witness testimonies of ancient remains of red-headed giants being reportedly found worldwide, in particular Lovelock Cave. Thus, one wonders, could this be a true depiction of not only the builders of the Nubian pyramids, but possibly Giza's Great Pyramids and the many other either publicly studied or covered up structures found around the world? It is a possibility which we find incredibly compelling. How can one still claim the pyramids to have been tombs when they are aware of the astounding burial chambers found within the Valley of the Kings? With the tomb of the sons of Ramses II being not only the largest, but what many archaeologists believe, second to the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx, is the next greatest discovery ever made within ancient Egypt. A literal labyrinth of chambers, it was initially discovered in 1825, yet due to its gargantuan scale, it wasn't until 1995, and thanks to an Egyptologist known as Kent R. Weeks, that we have begun to re-establish its true possible size. The tomb was examined several times, even being investigated by Howard Carter himself, Yet due to the outer tombs having been looted in antiquity, he simply used them as a dumping ground for rubble. It was not until 1995, during the Theban mapping project, when Weeks decided to clear the outer tombs. Approximately 70 rooms lined along long corridors running far back into the hillside were found. The number of rooms were then said to correspond to the number of sons the pharaoh sired. However, further excavations have revealed that the tomb is even larger, the size of an underground town cut directly from a granite hillside, its true scale still unknown. As of 2006, at least 130 chambers have so far been discovered, yet work continues on clearing the rest of this underground maze. We feel that although a later civilization, one lacking the knowledge to build such monuments, came along and claimed these relics as their own, with the possible motivation of an illusion of power, 
like that of the many other sites we cover worldwide, predictably, now also conveniently tied to these groups in academia. Yet the true feat these chambers would have been, along with the riches these pharaohs often left behind, are not only proof that these creations and collections of wealth were not only far beyond the ability of copper-wielding academically claimed builders, but that the archaeological evidence does indeed support the theory that these kings either ruled during the creator's civilization or built these monuments themselves. Yet how remains an infuriating enigma. We also feel their age, and indeed original lineage, in the true history of the Giza Plateau is what ultimately becomes convoluted. Yet I digress. Who built KV-5? It is a place we find highly compelling.